Welcome to the Fort Polk Podcast. Today we'll be exploring the exciting work that is being done by the Fort Polk Conservation Branch from their amazing efforts to protect native species on base to their role in shaping environmental policies within our local area. It's sure to be an educational and enlightening experience. So whether you're already invested in helping protect the environment here at home or simply curious as to how we can all best collaborate together towards a sustainable future, this is one conversation that you don't want to miss out on. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you are listening to this podcast, I'm Jeff England from the Fort Polk Public Affairs Office, and this is the Fort Polk Podcast. Today we have from the conservation branch here on Fort Polk, I've got Amy Brennan. How are you doing? I'm good. How are oh, you, that's, Jeff? I'm, I'm awesome. That's it's very, just, it's a mighty big cup of coffee you have. Oh, time. I know. It, 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 it really helps. Uh, <laughs> we also have with us today, Ken Moore. How are you doing, Ken? Good. All right. And Chris Melder. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing great. Uh, the Conservation Branch, that is part of DPW and Environmental. And uh, people here on Fort Polk actually know you guys as the Rock Shop. Or at least I do. <laughs> That's where I, I mean, it's like, I got to call the Rock Shop. Who? The Environmental. All right. Environmental. It's the Rock Shop. <laughs> we got a bunch of rocks over there. What's up with that? There are a bunch of rocks in the Rock Shop. Yeah, it's kind of a uh, part of our... So within conservation, we also have, in addition to our wildlife biologists, we have um, archaeologists. Ooh, that's so cool. It is pretty cool. And that's kind of where the name Rock Shop came from, because there's a bunch of fossils and stone artifacts and stuff like that, that there. You know, that really amazes me. That uh, that always surprised me that there's a bunch of, um, that there is a bunch of um, fossils. Well, not fossils. Well, yeah, fossils. Mm -hmm. That's It's like ancient ancient animals and stuff like that. It's, yep. People have been living here for a very long time. I guess. Animals too. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> and the swamp and the alligators and it's Megalodon. No, that's a, that's a shark. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the environmental shop, you are in charge of, well, other than protecting the environment and making sure that we don't ruin anything. Um, I believe there's, there's several uh, parts of it. And, you know, uh, one of the main things that we've got today that we'll be talking about is, uh, endangered species. And if I'm not mistaken, we have two, uh, well, no one endangered and one threatened. Okay. So we've got one endangered, one threatened, and, um, then we've got, uh, environmental for like, um, Water treatment, is that under you guys? It is. So the overall kind of structure of environmental, which, as you said earlier, falls under the director to public works. So environmental has three different branches in the division. We've got our compliance uh, branch, and they handle more of like truly like kind of compliance regulatory type things. So they handle uh, water quality, air quality, hazardous waste and stuff like that. Then we've got our forestry or natural resources branch. And they're the ones that do all the, the uh, prescribed burns and makes everything <laughs> all smoky, makes things, it's like, ah, it's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do a lot to help uh, take care and manage our forests. So they uh, run like the timber inventories and prescribed burning and also respond to wildfires here on the installation. And then the third is what uh, Ken, Chris, and I fall under, which is the conservation branch. We're kind of more... Uh, colloquially known as the birds and bunnies branch. Birds um, and bunnies. <laughs> because we kind of do this other um, set of a catch-all natural resources management. So we have a lot of wildlife biologists. We also have, we do have our archaeologists as well. The NEPA team falls under conservation too. So it's a, environmental as a whole has a lot of different aspects and a lot of different people working at it. Yeah, we're going to have to get the, we're going to have to get the animals in, in, uh, all the animals in here because I've seen, you know, over the years that I've been here, I've seen a lot of different animals that I did not expect to see. Um, <laughs> and in our old building, before we moved into this building, our old building, I believe there was a fox living over there, oh. like a gray fox or something else. It it's like, what is it? it that's, that's weird. I thought it was a giant dog cat mix, but mm -hmm. no, I guess it was, it was a fit. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Keith had mentioned to me before that there's a snapping turtle in the little like Creek down here. Oh, there's that there, <laughs> over in the pond over at the, um, 
uh, turtle pond <laughs> the, over at the golf course. Um, I was walking that course. Yes, I used to walk that course. <laughs> But As anyway, stares I, I was walking that course uh, one day and I came across a little baby snapping turtle. It was about that big. Cute. And I picked it up and uh, it had really sharp claws. But I, <laughs> I but I threw it back in the water because it was it was out probably, probably going to get snapped up by a hawk or something. I don't know. <laughs> but that's one thing that I haven't seen around here are hawks. I see a lot of buzzards. Mm. Buzzards and uh, I hear the owls. I never see them. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we've got, um, so we've got, uh, the environment, uh, I did do, I did get to go over and see the water treatment plant where it's not, it's not treating water to drink. It's just treating water to put back in the environment. So it, it cleans up the water and makes it nice and in clean to go back into the streams. And then it goes back into the <laughs> streams and stuff that yeah, that's pretty cool. I've done, I've done so, some work with you guys and <laughs> I have. Uh, you know, recycling and and uh, water cleanup and water runoff, mm -hmm. uh, wastewater. Uh, and <laughs> I'll have to show you that. I'll have to show you that uh, thing. I did a, um, a cartoon or an animated spot for y'all. No, I, it was pretty cool because it was, oh, was my, it the beavers? Yeah, the beavers okay. one. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I had I had some icon. Well, I had some some trash floating down the water, and, <laughs> and if you pay attention, you'll see that one of them is one of the little poop emojis. <laughs> but hey, it worked. <laughs> so, Ken, why don't you tell us a little about what you do over there? Well, I'm responsible for managing endangered species. So endangered species. All one endangered yeah. because the other one's threatened. Yeah, see, I, I learn. I learn. So what's the difference between threatened and endangered? Well, with uh, threatened, you have rules that you have to follow that the Fish and Wildlife puts out. With endangered species, you have to, if you do a project that might harm a woodpecker, mm -hmm. you have to do conferencing with the local Fish and Wildlife uh -oh. office. And we see those. Uh, you have... Um, they're not traps. They're more like birdhouses yes. out there. So the, that's one of our major duties we do is provide them housing and make sure that uh, make sure that you don't mess with these little birdhouses out there. Uh, these the um, what really got me was when I first saw a red cockaded woodpecker, which is the the endangered species we're talking about. Um, I'm so used to, you know, I grew up with Woody Woodpecker. <laughs> so I have an idea of what a woodpecker looks like. And when I saw this red cockaded woodpecker, it's like, that does not look like, it looked like a sparrow. Or I mean, it was, a, it was, it's really small. And I had to look really hard just to find the red. And it's like, what? what? <laughs> it really threw me off. It didn't have the little red head and the, the feathers that go up like a... Yeah, basically, you have to have it in your hand to see the red. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's like, well, what? why do they call it a red cockaded woodpecker? What? Um, in the, during the French-British War, uh -huh. uh, the soldiers put feathers in their hats. And some of them were red. Did they call him a Yankee Doodle Dandy? <laughs> they called him a cockade. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. That's where they got. Okay, I got you. <laughs> so, yeah, that's one of the things that uh, we try to tell soldiers in particular, like in terms of identifying this guy. If you see red on a woodpecker, it's probably not the red cockaded woodpecker. Yeah, this they're, they're more like a grayish or a, a dull. White well, and black. White and black, yeah. Well, and, white and black make gray. And people so. don't realize. <laughs> people don't realize we have twelve no. or thirteen species of woodpecker. Yeah, in, in North curve. America, yeah. in this area, we have uh, seven woodpeckers. Seven. I've seen at least and, three. Yeah, within Louisiana. at least three. They're one's huge. Yeah, and they, yeah, and yeah. they do not care what they're pecking on. It's like <laughs> they, it's like, dude, dude, that's metal. <laughs> pecking on a metal box it's like dude, you're not going there's nothing in there for you um well they'll do that that's to signify their range uh, woodpeckers call drumming uh -huh. the males will do that on dead trees on light fixtures you know street light fixtures they bang on it to tell other woodpeckers this is my territory admire get out <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's or is it more like warriors come out and play? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I 
Uh, you have to be old to know that <laughs> reference. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the the what are they what are they actually drumming on the or the pecking on the the trees for? I mean, because I've seen some that that they'll peck on the trees to get insects, but then I've seen other ones where they're shoving like nuts into the uh, into the trunk. Or they'll they'll drill a hole and then they'll stuff it full of something. Is is there? There is a species of woodpecker that does that, but not in this area. Uh, then I saw it somewhere because it was crazy. It was like this tree. It now, had all these holes in it, but they were all filled. <laughs> we in the winter we have the yellow bellied sap sucker, which will drill holes in trees in a line. Uh huh. Yeah. And what they do, they lick the sap that comes out of the holes. They'll come back over time, keeping the wounds open to keep the sap running so they can. Uh, you would that. think that they would do that up in the northeast, you know, get some good maple syrup out of those trees. <laughs> they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least now we know why they call it up sap suckers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, and what does the, the red cockaded woodpecker that uh, what does that eat? It eats uh, mainly insects. In- it's, so it's an insectivore. See, I did my studying. <laughs> Mainly uh, spiders, small centipedes, any any kind of insect. Uh, we need more of them around they, this building. We get millipedes around here like you wouldn't believe. They're, they're like, crazy. They like uh, actually roaches. There's a lot of roaches that uh, live in the the forest that people don't realize. There's lots of and roaches. the buildings. And, well, they're well, they're not after the ones in the buildings, but the one out there and, native in the buildings, they're. Uh, Invasive. Invasive. Oh, yeah, they are. Yes. <laughs> and huge. <laughs> Our old building was just filled with them. It's like, I'm so glad that they tore that thing down. <laughs> so, uh, so Chris, uh, what what do you do over at the uh, environmental? All right. So, I, uh, I'm a biologist as well. I'm kind of the lead biologist. I am a uh, kind of a contractor, actually a cooperator with Colorado State University through the Center of Environmental Management of Military Lands. So we have a five-year cooperative that we've had on the installation for over 20 years. I've been here for since 1999 working for Colorado State University. And uh, I am considered the Louisiana pine snake expert, but I don't truly believe there are Louisiana pine snake experts because there's so much that we don't I, know about. I think you. Well, I as don't call myself as you can that. be. <laughs> well, maybe as expert as the next one down from the snake itself. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> I also do a lot of the uh, the field work that goes on with the red cockaded woodpecker, and uh, we've done a you know a lot of different work with many many different species through the years. Um, you know what? We're gonna have to get you. What's that? A Slytherin uh, <laughs> uh, jacket or something. Sounds good. I would love that. <laughs> the sli- <laughs> it's like, why is he wearing that? Because he is the snake. <laughs> Do you speak parcel tongue? <laughs> mm, I'm working on it. Working on it's, it. Right. It's taking some time. And um, so you're the, so uh, how endangered, what's the difference between endangered and um, threatened? It's basically... There's how many there are left, right? Or how to, to a point, but like Ken said, there's a rule. There's rules that go in with threatened species, and then with endangered species. It, it, a lot of just the politics. I, ah, mean, I got through you. the administrative through administrative work. Now, what are the, what are the levels of um, threatened or endangered? So that's one of the things that's kind of interesting about all of this is we use these words and they have different meanings depending on what kind of level we're talking about. Yeah. It's like the, like the terrorist threat level. It's like <laughs> today it's magenta. What? Right, yeah. It's like orange yesterday. Wait, wait, it might be purple. I don't know. So what we're talking about as far as the red cockaded woodpecker being our endangered species and the Louisiana pine snake being our threatened species, we're referring to how it is federally listed under the endangered species act. There are other classification systems that kind of come into play and make it a little bit more confusing. Um, but for our purposes, we really just go with what the the federal system says. But you're going to protect them all the same. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we do our best to monitor and, and protect all the species that we have here. But Well, generally what makes endangered species, it's endangered over all of its range. Oh, okay. We're threatening it can be just parts. Got oh, So it's like in this area, it's it's in bad shape. But over here, it's not as bad. 
Correct. Gotcha. So a lot of people get confused because we'll be talking about, you know, again, endangered and threatened as like our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, like designated kind of definitions. But there's also one of the things that most people commonly refer to is the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List. Um, So this red list is like it's what when you go to Wikipedia and you're looking at like a a Wikipedia page for an animal, that's the list that's underneath the picture of the animal. So to add even more confusion to it, our red cockaded woodpecker for the red list is listed as threatened, but for the pine snake, it's listed as endangered. <laughs> you have, I, I put a mat in front of you, so, <laughs> so you won't bang his open so much. But the, uh, the red list is, uh, that's, that's, uh, it's more of a global yeah. kind of international. How, how, how many places are, are the red wood or bleh, the woodpecker, this one that we're talking about, uh, how many locations are they found? There are many and most of it's on federal. There are some on state land. Mostly throughout the southeastern United Southeast. States. Yeah, so. there's actually 13 large populations of red cockaded woodpeckers that we call donor populations. And these are the population that, that most people are focusing on as far as uh, when we reach those goals of those 13 populations, then we're going to consider, you know, downlisting, which oh, that, that, is, that is actually idea. getting close to that. Oh, US really? Fish and Wildlife Service is you considering. guys have been doing a great job. <laughs> we like to think so. <laughs> we try. I hear, I hear that uh, some, of the, some of the people get mad. It's like, oh, man, we can't do our exercise now. Why? They found a red cockaded woodpecker. But that's a good thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> excuse me. The, um, so um, how do you help train people to recognize and and do all that you know recognize them not bother them uh what's the um the you know like the training mission kind of stuff yeah so we do a bunch of different education and outreach efforts um we do different things like just for the community and at different events um that we host like mwr events and then also like we host our annual catfish derby we're educating people at those um as far as the training mission goes though we brief every home OCT and every guest OCT that comes here. Um, in addition to all of the installation environmental compliance officers about the red cockaded woodpecker and the Louisiana pine snake to make sure that everyone knows how to identify these guys and then what the restrictions are. So luckily for our rotational units, there aren't too many restrictions um, as far as the red cockaded woodpecker goes. The biggest thing is we have their um, the cluster sites where the birds live out in the training area. Um, And so really our biggest restrictions there are people not staying in those areas for too long and not doing anything that really damages the trees that these birds are living in. So we, we give a full on brief to that, to all of our, uh, all of our soldiers here. Yeah. I had, um, I had three Louisiana longleaf pines on my, uh, I guess they were called marker trees, uh, on my property. And, um, one got struck by lightning and basically killed the, the tree. And before it fell over, (laughs) it took a while, but before it fell over, I think either, uh, woodpeckers or something got into it because there were holes all over that thing. (laughs) (laughs) It was crazy. And then it fell over and then it's like, wow, this this thing's almost hollow. (laughs) It's crazy. It's, yeah, it's just to g- give you an idea of what Amy was talking about, we have actually uh, spoken or briefed over 9,200 uh, OCT briefs have been given to soldiers since uh, 2016. 9,200? Soldiers, yes. In a lot of briefs. Eight years. <laughs> Correct. Or seven years. Seven? So eight. yeah, Amy's Something doing a great like job with that. <laughs> I have to pull out my calculator, figure out how many years it is. <laughs> that's crazy. That is a lot of, that's a lot of training. Yep. Every rotation that comes in, we talk to them. You know, dang, nine, that 92 session, 9,200 sessions, mm-hmm. that's not like well, just 9,200 people. It's no, 9,200 9, people. people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 9, man, that's people. like, that's like a, <laughs> 900 a day. <laughs> You're a busy person. <laughs> But um, yeah, so so you're training them, and yeah, you you show them um, what to look for, um, 
what not to do, uh, how to stay away from them, uh, how to identify them. Um, I still to this day cannot identify the Louisiana pine snake. Uh, it looks like a snake. And yeah. <laughs> it looks like a snake. Yeah. So the Louisiana pine snake is one of 48 different species of snakes that you can encounter in Louisiana. And they are, it's quite confusing if you're not. <laughs> I've encountered quite a few of them. <laughs> Yeah. Everything from from little ra- uh, little like garden racers or gardener snakes uh, or garter snakes uh, to uh, copperheads and cottonmouths and the black mamba and uh, uh, king well, cobra. Black and, mamba. Um, that no, that's that's going to be an African species and king cobra probably Southeast Asia. It's it's also it's also a really cool cape in uh, Megamind. The black uh, mamba. That's true. I forgot about that one. Yeah. See, I'm here to help. <laughs> We're here for you. <laughs> so um, overall, if we had, um, what would your days include? I mean, um, it's one thing to be all about protecting the environment, but to actually work in that field, uh, to actually go out every day. And uh, your goal is to make our environment just a little bit better. Uh, what would, could you give me like just an overview, maybe a, just like, what do you guys, what does your day include other than training 9,200 people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, my day is a little bit different than what Ken and Chris's is, is um, because I'm our conservation outreach specialist also with Colorado State University. So I do more of kind of like the talking with people, doing events, um, training soldiers, uh, things like that. But I do, I have had the opportunity to help out with some of our fieldwork efforts. And so a lot of what Ken and Chris spend their time with is, you know, outdoors doing woodpecker work and also a little bit less time consuming, but also pine snake work. Yeah. <laughs> you got, you have, you have what, two snakes that you, you take out to all of your, your Mario shows? and Luigi. Mario and Luigi. You know, they named, they named uh, two pieces of equipment in the, um, B Jack, Mario and Luigi. Did they really? Yeah. So was it an homage to the? Snakes? I have no clue. But I really hope so. I went in there. It's like these. These are their two big. Uh, I think it's like blood separators or blood uh, oh. testers or something like that. And uh, they named them Mario and Luigi. So Cute. that now I know I can remember some names. All right, <laughs> sweet. Do, can you tell the? Can you tell them apart? Oh, easily. Do they yeah. wear name tags? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, we don't really need name tags for Mario and Luigi. Um, there's enough of a difference, like just kind of subtly in, in their scales and also size wise. Luigi's a bit bigger than Mario, gotcha. even though they're actually right around the same age. They're from the same club. Well, Luigi is taller than, than Mario. So exactly. Yeah. In sense. the game. So it fits. <laughs> so what about any birds? Do you have any birds that are, uh, that you keep around or you pretty much leave them be? We leave them be. Oh, okay, that's cool. But at least you give them houses. We do low low income housing. Mm-hmm. No <laughs> government high, subsidized high, government subsidized housing. <laughs> <laughs> Big old condos out there with like all kinds of birds in them. But um, so well, the yeah, re- and Ken and Chris can talk a little bit more about how that goes. Well, the reason we do that is the woodpecker requires an older tree, seventy years or older. Because at that age, they usually have heart rot where it's easy for the birds to. Oh, yeah. So they cl- they like clear out a hole inside and then build their nest in there? That's correct. And uh, these days, we don't have many trees that old because, you know, they cut them all down. Yeah. 70 years ago. <laughs> so we put artificial cavities up. We can put them in trees as long as they're 15 inches in diameter at 20 feet. Uh huh. We can place an artificial insert into it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Do, you, do you guys... Um, now that's into a real tree or live tree. So you the, go, you'll go in there and, and open up. Uh, what we do, we do, uh, we go up there, we trace the outline of the box and we use plunge cuts with chainsaws to cut out the, as long, as long as the uh, tree is wide enough. So yeah, 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 that's, and then we, we cut slots in it and just pop out the, the bark and slide the box into. Oh, that's so cool. And then that makes it easy to inspect and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, that is so cool. So what are you inspecting for when you go up? Um, Cause I, I've always been told since I've been here, do not mess with the boxes. If you see one, just leave it alone. Walk, stay away from it. Um, what do you, what do you guys do when you go to inspect a uh, little bird's nest? 
Well, the nesting season, we go to check for nesting. Nesting. Eggs, young. And we've been all our young. So have, have you found a bunch of eggs yet? No, they only, uh, they start nesting in late April through oh, okay. first of June. Yeah, because my chicken's not laying any eggs right now. <laughs> it's not even a year old, but I have one chicken. One. I had a bunch of them. I had like 13. <laughs> then our neighbor's dogs came over and killed all, almost all of them. Mm. Ugh. I should have gotten you guys out there and conserved my chickens. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the uh, so we got the birds are insectivores, and I have a feeling the snakes are not insectivores. <laughs> that is correct. What They're, does a what does a Louisiana pine snake like to eat? Well, in fact, there are no in, well, there are no there are insectivore snakes, but there are no a lot of people. A good question is: Are there any vegetarian snakes? They are not, of course. <laughs> they only eat other animals, okay? And that includes other snakes. So, yeah, Louisiana... That king snake eats other snakes. That is correct. Yeah. There are many other snakes. <laughs> many of snakes that, yeah. Uh, so, Louisiana pine snakes' uh, primary uh, prey is going to be the Baird's pocket gopher, which is a very common co uh, pocket gopher, a, a very common rodent that you can encounter throughout Louisiana. And uh, Louisiana pine snakes... So, so we know that they're not rare because of lack of prey. There are plenty of gophers to mm -hmm. eat. Uh, Louisiana pine snakes, as Ken was mentioning, the forest of this area had, you know, 100, 100, up to like in the 1890s or so, we started cutting all these forests down. Now, we cut them down for a good reason. I mean, we fought two world wars. We built all of our infrastructure out of this virgin longleaf pine, which is, you know, amazing Amazing wood that we use to build all our structure. Our whole, you know, communities are built on this, this, you know, cutting these these trees down. But at the same time, we impacted a lot of species. Red cockaded woodpecker is one of those species, as well as Louisiana pine snakes. Many, many other species have been impacted by going out and clear cutting these forests. There were over ninety million acres of longleaf pine at one point. And now we have around 3 million acres. Oh, wow. So it's a lot less. Fort Polk is full of longleaf. We should be proud of that. There's a lot of military installations that have a lot of longleaf pine ecosystem left. What? That's why you find these endangered species on uh, military installations. Do we have any species here or had? Did we have any that have gone extinct? Uh I, I would imagine. At root time, there's been a lot of species that, well, yeah, they you say, know, passenger mm -hmm. pigeons. Mm -hmm. to, I mean, the list goes on and on. We had that here at one point. Ivory-billed woodpecker. Uh, yeah, ivory, well, and, and <laughs> that's a different habitat. But yes, there's been a lot of, and, and was, initially we do it for a, the purpose is a good purpose because we're trying to build our communities. But at the same time, we may have done it in a kind of an incorrect way. We should have done it more of a conserve, you know, well, take some of the forest, not all of the forest. Yeah. The issue is we planted them back in loblolly, dense stands of trees you see around here for the paper mill. This is on private. And gophers, like gophers cannot live in pine plantations because there's not enough ground cover for them to consume. Oh, okay. That, that, the, roots, like, the roots. Oh, I, I was thinking, it's like, wow, they need cover to... <laughs> Yeah. Cover me. It's like, I'm going in. <laughs> Go. So as far as why this snake, you were asking about the snake, why the snake is, uh, is so it's rare, but it's also very secretive. It spends a lot of time underground in within the tunnels of these gophers. So when we say rare, um, Louisiana pine snake is thought to be one of the rarest animals in all of North America. Really? It truly is. When we, it's only found in eastern Texas and western Louisiana. So 14 counties in Texas and seven parishes in Louisiana. And that's it from the historical findings of the snake since 1927. So it's yeah. a very rare animal. Yeah. Fort Polk is one of three populations that currently exist in the wild. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. Well, two populations. Well, it's three. There's a, there's a population up in Bienville Parish near Kepler Lake that is actually on private lands. And that's actually the largest Louisiana pine snake population, we believe. And then in the last um, 15 years, we've only encountered snakes on Fort Polk, 
<clears throat> and on Peace and Ridge, which we manage both of those populations. Wow. So it's a rare snake and we have, a you know, the fact that we still have wild Louisiana pine snakes out there on army owned property is pretty amazing. Now there are some releases that have occurred uh, in Grant Parish uh, on Forest Service property. And uh, that's releases from zoos. So that's another way that, you know, when you have a situation where there's very few snakes in the wild, what are your options? Well, we do have healthy zoo populations and there is talk, well, there has been snakes that have been released on Forest Service property uh, in, uh, like I said, Grant Parish. That is crazy. Mm-hmm. So now I'm going to I'm going to pay more attention to Mario and Luigi because <laughs> now right. I know now at least now I know why I've never seen one, you know, or come across one. Yes. Uh, first, yeah. uh, they're underground. Thank God. And, <laughs> and second, there's like one. <laughs> okay, yeah, there's give, two. To there's give two. you an idea of just kind of how rare it is. And this is like what I usually talk about with soldiers as well. So. Like in comparison of our two species, we've got the red cockaded woodpecker. Right now in Fort Polk, we probably have somewhere around 800 between Fort Polk and Peace and Ridge. But they're tiny. Yeah, they're small. <laughs> <laughs> but we have about 800 of those woodpeckers like at this moment. Compared to the Louisiana pine snake in the past 30 years, we've only encountered like 53 Louisiana so is pine threatened, snakes. So is threatened uh, more or, I mean, higher on the list than endangered? So... No, no, that's kind of what we were talking about earlier. Between, yeah, it's confusing, which is why, according to the red list, the Louisiana pine snake is endangered and the red cockaded woodpecker is threatened. But as far as our official Fish and Wildlife Service legal definitions, the red cockaded woodpecker is endangered and the Louisiana pine snake is threatened. Okay. All right. Yeah, 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 you're right. It's <laughs> a little kind confusing. of confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what are the levels of threatened species? I mean, there's threatened, endangered gravely endangered so according uh, to the red list which again is not really what we go off of as far as like kind of our legal working definitions but the the red list has extinct extinct in the wild critically endangered endangered vulnerable near threatened um, and conservation dependent and then least concern so something of least concern is going to be like the mosquito <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mosquitoes. Why can't they be endangered? <laughs> Stupid mosquitoes. Right. I'm Certain still mad at like, Noah for putting him putting two mosquitoes on the on the ark. They probably stowed away. Well, just <laughs> just remember those mos- you know f- things eat um, eat mosquitoes. There's a lot of bats. Mm-hmm. They're, they're tasty. But bats also eat moths. So let's get a better <laughs> argument. <laughs> Good point. I, I don't disagree. I think the only thing that really relies on the mosquito is the mosquito fish. And that eats the larva. So <laughs> that's the only thing. And I think we can probably do without those. Or we could feed them something different. <laughs> we'll bring them over to you. <laughs> right. But yeah, so so again, kind of based on these two different lists, you know, there's a bunch of different levels based on like what the red list does. But for our concern, we really just like manage them both like with the same mindset of we want to do what we can to preserve and, and protect uh, these populations as well as we can. Now, are there any other species out there that you guys are, you know, just aware of keeping an eye on kind of stuff? So <laughs> that's why so. I brought up bats. Yeah. <laughs> but so there's, there's two bats that we're concerned about. One, a tricolor bat that is potentially going to be listed here in the future. And then there's a northern long-eared bat that is currently listed as threatened and is going to be potentially listed as endangered soon. Uh Uh-oh. But yeah, in addition to those two species of bats, we've also got the alligator snapping turtle that is a, uh, we call them uh, candidate species, so candidates for inclusion on the endangered species list. That is something I don't mess with. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Um, You said the alligator snapping turtle. Yes. Now there are, because... There's at least two, because I know of the alligator snapping turtle and just the regular snapping turtle. Right. We have the common snapping turtle and the alligator snapping turtle. So the um, difference is in terms of looks, the alligator snapping turtles, I've heard some of the old timers around here call them three road turtles. So they've got three distinct rows of kind of ridges on, on their back shell. Um, common snapping turtles, especially as they get older, it's more smooth. I tend to think of the difference between the two of them as far as looks go is the alligator snapping turtles really look like a dinosaur. They are, (laughs) you know, 
there's edges, they're gnarled, yes. they real are big intense. heads, real big heads, real noticeable beaks. So they're yep. they're a lot of they're again they're pretty monstrous looking. They're yeah. great. <laughs> I think the the little baby one I found was uh, just a regular one. And thank God it was that small because I picked it up like this and on either side of the shell, I did not want it. And it, it he started flipping his head backwards to try to get to me. It's like, nope. <laughs> yeah, you definitely got to be careful yeah. with, with really any turtle because they can they can get you from further away than you think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. It's not just animals that are endangered or and it's not just animals that are protected. We have some plants, you know, in the area that are um, are similar. Uh, you know, they've got that. And the one that I noticed and it amazed me especially when i was able to find them out in the wild are the pitcher plants the uh, mm. the carnivorous plants and mm-hmm. that we have around here and i did not realize that until one day somebody told i think it was probably somebody from environmental <laughs> yeah no we have we have pitcher plants uh they're they're and so i went over there and looked it's like oh wow look at those, those yeah i think we actually insects. have four different species of carnivorous plants on the installation really but yeah the pitcher plants are definitely like the most kind of noticeable they're the poster child of yeah. carnivorous plants well i don't know <laughs> Uh, I, I think well, uh, fly trap uh, what was the Audrey two? <laughs> the Audrey two is probably the uh, the most popular carnivorous plant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> it's the little Sorry. shop of horrors. Oh, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> Feed me. <laughs> that now that was really a carnivorous plant. True, no. and it sang. True. I, <laughs> I will say, um, yeah, there was one time I was uh, doing a brief to an unnamed unit. Uh, I mentioned that we had carnivorous plants and this guy came up to me after I was done with my brief and he was like, so wait, like human eating plants? And I was like, no, 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 no. Just the big ones. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) (laughs) I was like, no, 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 no. They they eat insects. They're not eating human flesh. (laughs) Yet. (laughs) <laughs> right we gotta be careful they but there's always all... a first uh do we have any venus flytrap because that to me is no. the that when i think of carnivorous plants that's what i think of is the venus flytrap but there are uh there's pitcher plants and um there uh, yeah sundews sundews is that the which one is the one is that the one that where that has like the sticky things and it and it curls up on it yeah. i want to see what those. <laughs> those are cool we need to get you out with our botanist. You do. You do. When I was in when I was in uh, Korea, I went out with entomology mm. and um, I did a whole story on mosquitoes. Mm. So uh, we went over to the, the mosquito traps and they say, uh, if you don't like being bitten by mosquitoes, do not hang out by the mosquito traps because <laughs> they're meant to attract mosquitoes. Uh, we went back and we separated them and sexed them. And uh, so now I know how to identify uh, the male mosquito, which won't bite you, and the female mosquito, which you just want to kill on, on sight. Mm. But, and it's funny because when I tell people, it's like, no, the, the male mosquito has a beard. A beard. A beard. Well, isn't that it's, something? Yeah. So it's like, oh, that's cool. So I, going out with environmental and uh, is, yeah, it's very interesting to me. I, <laughs> I like to do that, especially with all the stuff that you guys do over there. Work with the environment, the uh, protection of the plants and the animals and uh, the designation of um, or the designating of the the special trees. Uh, the uh, century tree. No. Is that what it is? There's a tree right there by the, the marquee. Right. Yeah. So there are there's um, like a, a list of national uh, and state big trees. And that's one of the I think I believe state that's like one of the largest Louisiana longleaf pine trees oh, nice. in, in this state. Um, but yeah, you're talking like right again by the marquee yeah. kind of across from the golf course there. Um, yeah. And we have a few other trees that are actual national champions. I think like our American gallberry or something like that is one of the national champions. So yeah, we have a, a nice list of big trees. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. So we have, there's a bunch of different kind of areas that have different, um, as far as training restrictions go. So some are more like regimented and ruled out. Like, again, like I was mentioning by the woodpecker trees, like not staying in those areas too long. That's like in the regulations. Um, but there's also certain things that we kind of request as far as like wetlands, you know, we try to protect our wetlands. And so we mark those off, um, so that we don't have a whole bunch of strikers kind of rutting those up. (laughs) Well, after these storms, my, uh, my front yard is now considered a wetland (laughs) and I got a new puppy. So I have to walk him like every five minutes. 
What kind of puppy is it? Twoodle. Oh, he's so cute. Precious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's cute. And I've got a, and we got a, another one. That's our second twoodle. We have another twoodle. He's like three years old. Now, what is that? A, what mixed with a poodle? That is a uh, uh, teddy bear golden doodle, which is oh. a English, an English lab. An English Labrador and a poodle mix and then a schnoodle, which is a um, schnauzer and a poodle mix. Well, that sounds adorable. Yeah, he is. He's. I want to know why he's not up here right now. Uh, actually, I almost brought him to work, but <laughs> I have to take him into the vet and make sure, give him a little checkup and oh. stuff and make sure he's OK because we just got him on Monday. So, Cute. <laughs> but uh, so we got uh, snakes and spiders. <laughs> oh, the no, no protected spiders, right? So they're fair game. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily fair game, but I never realized how many different kinds of spiders there are until I opened up a, a mud dauber's uh, <laughs> ne- or nest or oh, whatever. Yeah. It's like those, yeah. I didn't even know those those things were around. <laughs> like, what are these little spiders? Yeah, a lot of like, people don't know that we have a, a native tarantula here in Louisiana. Ooh, that's cool. <laughs> how big does it get? Not as big as some tarantulas, but. Yeah. Tarantula size. <laughs> How can you tell the difference between a tarantula and a regular spider? That's a good question. Mainly the the, the size. Yeah, they're just the size. Yeah, and they're a lot hair. The the tarantula she's talking about is uh, I think it's an Arkansas uh, chocolate. It's uh it's quite hairy. It doesn't like to shave, huh? It does not <laughs> like to shave. Correct. Yeah, there are over I think thirty five thousand different species of spiders in with within the world. I mean, there's a lot of different species and. Uh, People assume that, you know, well, every spider can bite me. And there's not that many that actually have large enough mouth parts to, to bite people. Like the daddy long legs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I've I, OK. When it comes to spiders, there's two uh, venomous ones that I know. And notice that I use the correct term. <laughs> venomous, yeah. Yeah. And they're not poisonous. <laughs> um, the brown recluse and the black widow. Mm hmm. I've grown up with black widows. I mean, I've seen them everywhere. Never once in my life have I ever heard of anyone getting bitten by a black widow. But a brown recluse will go out of its way just to hunt you down and bite you. (laughs) It's like you don't even have to be bothering. I know a person that got bit by a brown recluse in his sleep. So I know he was not. Well, they're kind of different types of spiders. (laughs) Yeah. Black widow is a web spider. Yeah. So it, it can't crawl very well. Oh, really? But a brown recluse is a ground, I guess we call it a ground spider. It walks around like a wolf spider. Uh huh. So it's, you have more likely of it encountering you than. I did not know widow. that web spiders cannot walk very well. No. They, if you ever knock a web spider down and watch it try to move, it can walk, but it's very oh, how slow weird. and awkward. I, it, I saw one, uh, I was uh, rinsing off the patio once and uh, sprayed, or it got a black widow web. Apparently it was protecting its uh, egg sac or something. And that thing shot out of nowhere. Just it's like, and then it saw, it's like, nope, can't protect my egg sac from this guy. <laughs> it's like, oh, that was, that was crazy. It moved fast, but it was on the web. Yeah. So they, I could, well, yeah. you, you also have to realize that the type of venom that they each have. One has a more of a neurotoxic venom, which is going to affect your nervous system. Uh-huh. And you could get bit. The neurotoxic venom would come from the, uh, the black widow. Yeah. And you may not even know you got bit. And you might just get sick and you're not even, you know, don't even know. And then with a brown recluse, it's more of a hemotoxic venom where you see up, you know, a significant, you know, a, a big, ugly oh, sore yeah. that occurs. Yeah, like so like necrosis. Correct. Ah. So, and that same thing could be said about, you know, different snakes. Because that's one thing I, I like to talk to you about, you know, the public about snakes and how different snakes have very different venoms and how complex and, and, and. The, the biggest thing I always try to talk to the public about is how important uh, snakes are, snake, venomous snakes in particular, are in, uh, in research, in medical research. There's a lot to be said about uh, different, all kinds of different, uh, anything from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's disease. There's all these new uh, levels of medical uh, drugs that are coming out. Wouldn't that be cool if there was a snake out there that had the venom that like cures cancer? There, there has actually, been research on that, yeah. There is potential for that, yes. Really? Yes. Like <laughs> I said. Uh, Here, go get bit by the snake. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a snake no. <laughs> actually found in Brazil that, if you look at literature, it is thought to have saved more lives, more human lives than any other animal. Is a pit viper found in Brazil. Pit viper. 
Correct. <laughs> they so, call those because of the pits on their heads. Or is it because that's what they like to fight in? Pits. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fighting pit. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's just something to think about with, with snakes in particular. No, there's a lot of people that view snakes as, you know, the only good snake is the dead snake. Mm-hmm. I mean, Never. In, exactly. <laughs> there, there are obviously now are protected snakes that we have to think about. But in addition to that, even venomous snakes throughout the world, you know, there are some that can potentially, you know, cure disease. Oh, that is so, so it's cool. something to think about. And that's why we should all all look to the environment and protect it and not just, you know, and we're not asking you to change your life. We're just ch- asking you to pay attention. Yeah. You know, just uh, it's the little things. It's the little sure. things. I really appreciate you guys coming in here. Uh, Amy, Ken, Chris, uh, we we love that you came in. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, the audience, the live studio audience just loves you. Uh, and I, you know, the is very interesting and, and I appreciate you coming in and I would love to have you back so we can talk more. We went a little long today, uh, <laughs> but it's just because, you know, I'm, there's a lot to talk. There's about. a lot to talk about, and I think we'll have to break it down and and get into uh, more specific things at um, you know in the future. I, and I absolutely would love to have you guys back. I appreciate you coming in. I'm Jeff England. You've been listening to the Fort Polk podcast. Uh, tune in next week when we have another exciting uh, episode and subject. Thanks for all listening, and we'll listen at you later. <laughs>